Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, just bad news. Some negative news, but not today. <coughs> Deadliners have been, this has been all along. Uh, Deadlines for quizzes part one today, at yeah, end of day, 11.59, p.m. Then exam one, which covers the stuff we finished up last time, uh, and quizzes part two, which covers the stuff we started last time, and stuff we'll be talking about today in a few more days. Deadline five is May 29th. Then exam two, which covers part two, quizzes part three, deadline June 9th. And then exam three, deadline's June 17th. And then exam four, quizzes part four, exam five, Deadline of five, end of day, June 18th. For the paper, if you want to do a draft, as mentioned before, you can do as many drafts as you'd like until either you get the grade you want or you just get sick of the draft process or time comes to an end. Not all time, just draft time. And draft time ends on June 10th. If you want to get the extra credit, uh, the plus five bonus in the paper, uh, just be sure it's uploaded in a blackboard by June 11th. If you want full credit, you want to Spur in that plus five you know, bonus. June 15th is the deadline. You're going to get half credit June 18th. And if no credit, then I guess I'll turn it in. And then I'll have the grades in on June 19th. So be sure to contact me if there's any issues as soon as possible. Because before I finalize the grades, I can easily just you know go on go on iRaveler and make the needed change. But once they're in, you know, the iRaveler thing is approved grades, then it's Slightly more complicated, actually a lot more complicated. Before pressing on to the new stuff, any stuff about the stuff that has been or stuff to be that needs more stuff. Okay, so last time we started up with the stuff with philosophy and religion. Looked at a little background for that, and we started looking at the four questions relating to God. And they're the metaphysical questions. Or are, they're about the nature of God's and God's existence. So kind of the first question is, what is the nature of God? Like with my crappy example, said if someone asked you, you know, do you have glub glub in Florida? You'd probably ask them, what's glub glub? You'd say glub glub, small furry animal, lives in trees, eat acorns. You'd say, ah, you mean squirrels. Yes, and we have a lot of those things. And so if someone says, does God exist? You'd want to ask them, what do they mean by God? And the next question is, does God, as defined, exist? Then there are the epistemic questions about what we know. One first question is, how do we know the nature of God? People claim to know what God wants, what God's like. It's a fair question to ask, how do they know? And to give like a horrifying example, the people in ISIS believe they know what God wants. And a fair question, well, they're probably going to answer this question, but a fair question is, how do they know that? How do they have special access to the mind of God that's denied to all the rest of us? Then the next question is, how do we know God exists? And we'll look at answers to these questions. Now, historically, when people have approached the questions about God, there's been two main camps. There are those who believe that reason and logic can help us. So that's kind of camp one. And camp two are the people who say, reason and logic, no help at all. And those are pretty, two, pretty much the two main options. Reason and logic can help us, or it can't. Now, interestingly, importantly enough, the reason and logic camp splits into two subcamps. Now, the first camp is this. There are some folks who believe that you can use what's called a priori reasoning. And it means, you know, we get our word prior from this. And a good question would be, prior to what? And the answer is, prior to experience. Now, a priori reasoning is reasoning that you engage in that's not based in empirical experience. Another way to look at it, you know, kind of crudely put, is reasoning that involves pure reason. You're just using, you don't have to look, you don't hear, you just engage in pure logic. For example, that is my usual stupid example. of a part of our reasoning. Okay, so I've drawn a triangle on the board. How many sides does it have? Three. How did you know? Well, because you know by pure reason, by definition, that triangles have three sides. And so that'd be an example of a part of our reasoning. You don't have to look at it, you don't have to go and check and see, you know, one, two, three. Ah, 
three sides. We know by pure reason that triangles have three sides. Likewise for you know squares, we know they've got four sides. So a prior reasoning, kind of crudely put, is when you reason prior to experience. You can just work it out by pure thought. Now, one of the many thousands of debates in philosophy, also in the sciencey stuff, is this. Everyone, well, almost everyone believes that there's a priori reason. You can just you know, you use reasoning like mathematics, logic, etc. that just involves reasoning about stuff. And the big question, though, is can you use pure reason to prove whether things exist or not? In other words, could you be sitting there like in your, your armchair just thinking and work out a, a proof, a decisive proof for the existence of something? Now, some people think that this can be done in general, and some people make it more limited. We'll look at, for example, uh, St. Anselm and our good dead friend Leibniz, and also later on our good dead friend Descartes, who believed you could prove God's existence by pure reason. You don't have to go and look, you don't have to have a mystical experience, you can just be sitting in your chair, maybe watching a little Netflix, and you can just think it through and prove conclusively that God exists. They get into the sciencey stuff, similar question arises. Can a scientist sitting in her laboratory with you know a pencil or a laptop work out a proof of the existence of something? Or do you have to go and empirically look? And I'll give one concrete example and move on. One example of this is one thing that's been big in philosophy for a long time, big in science fiction for a really long time too, and also kind of big in science, is the idea of parallel universes, alternative worlds. Worlds like ours, but slightly different. And philosophers and sci-fi writers have long, you know, talked about them. Uh, Leibniz, for example, talked about all the, the possible worlds. Now, of course, we can't, as far as you know, visit them. You can't, like, <coughs> open a door and <coughs> hop to the universe, you know, beside ours. And some might would claim you could just by working it out through the mathematics prove there has to be such realities. Other people say that's BS. So recap, a priori reasoning is this. It's reasoning based on evidence that's not grounded in the senses. Pure a priori, a priori reasoning involves being able to prove the existence of things just by pure reason, pure logic, pure mathematics. <coughs> Examples of folks who bought into this include St. Anselm, we'll look at, Descartes, we'll also look at, and Leibniz, we'll also take a look at. <coughs> now in others, the other camp, are folks who believe that <coughs> the reasoning to be used is what's called a posteriori. From what we get our term posterior, meaning like after or <coughs> behind. And again, the question would be after or behind what? Well, this is reasoning that's after experience, essentially based in empirical evidence. Now, these guys, dead, well, these dead guys, they're what's known as rationalists, because they believe you, know, you can use a priori reasoning to prove the existence of stuff. The folks who believe in just a posteriori reasoning are called empiricists. Everyone's probably heard of like the empirical method or empirical evidence, and that's stuff that comes through the senses. So folks in this camp believe you're going to prove the existence of stuff, you've got to begin with the senses, empirical evidence. You just can't sit in an armchair and think about stuff. The famous dead guys who believe in this will be our good dead friend St. Thomas Aquinas in his classic Five Ways, and our good dead friend uh, David. Sorry about that. Our good dead friend David Hume, who will take a skeptical view of religion. Now, before moving away from a priori and a posteriori, anything about that stuff that needs more. So which one was imperial? The oh, the uh, this is uh, yeah, empiricism and rationalism. rationalism. And that's one of the visions that runs throughout pretty much all of philosophy. Rationalists believe you can prove stuff by just pure reason. They also believe in this stuff called innate ideas. Innate ideas is a fancy term for basically built-in ideas. It's a crappy analogy. Years ago, when you bought like a computer, like a Commodore 64, They'd be no, you wouldn't have a hard drive, there'd be nothing in there. You just have, you turn it, you plug it into the TV, turn it on, 
you have a blinking cursor. It's, it's a blank slate. But now when you buy like a you know a smartphone, it's got all kinds of stuff pre-installed on the you know the flash card in there. And you can think of any of the ideas as like pre-installed software. It's you know the idea is that the mind is not blank. There's all kinds of stuff already already in there. Now the empiricists reject any ideas. They believe the famous um, the phrase is tabula rasa, the blank slate. And they believe that the mind is, when you're born, it's, it's empty. And so there's a lot of you know, issues there. One is, how do you prove the existence of stuff? Rationalists think you can do it by pure reason. Empiricists say, that's BS, you need to have empirical evidence. You gotta get out there with you know, your telescopes, microscopes, and your eyes, and observe stuff. <coughs> In terms of the, the contents of the mind, the rationalists generally take the view that there's built-in stuff, built-in ideas, often like mathematics, morality, the ideas of God. And the empiricists say, nope, blank slate, tabula rasa. And that has all kinds of interesting implications for very practical things. Take, for example, child development. If humans are born with all kinds of stuff in there, then we're kind of pre-stocked. We're like pre-loaded. We can evolve, you know, so you, if we're already have that stuff in there, you don't have to teach, teach people stuff that. It's built in. If we're blank slates, then we got nothing. Everything that we get we have, has to come from the outside. So our approach to psychology, education, child development actually hinges on that. Do we have stuff built in, or is it just an empty bucket that you throw stuff, stuff in? Anything else? Now our second camp, big camp, are the folks who say reason and logic can't help you. One approach is pure faith. You just gotta believe. Reason is useless, logic is useless, only faith can suffice. Another option is, which may be combined with faith, is there's gotta be a mystical experience or divine revelation. A third option is to take the view that God is completely unknowable. You just can't know at all. And this can be seen as a skeptical position. Reason can't help you because there's no, no way to prove or disprove it. Now, one kind of unique approach is put forth by our good dead friend, Pascal. He, um, probably best known for his work in probability theory and gambling, but he also came up with a famous wager which he claims that God is your best bet. So those are our two main camps. Reason can help you, reason can't help you. In the reason camp, we got the a priori folks who think pure reason can prove God, or possibly disprove God. Then we got the a posteriori camp who believe you have to begin with empirical evidence to either prove or disprove God. So those are our main divisions. And pretty much any thinker can be kind of like stuck into one of those categories. Rationalist, empiricist, or reason can't help you. Best. Before pressing on, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff? Now, a good question would be so, how do we, like, if we're going to use reason, how do we use reason to argue for God? Now, one very common way to do this, and we'll, we'll see examples of this, are to use a combination of what's called a regress and a reductio ad absurdum, which you saw earlier. Now, they're not just limited to talking about, about God. They're kind of standard you know, methods in philosophy, and they're also used you know, outside of philosophy as well. And we've all seen examples of these, even though we might not have heard them named this way. The first one, type of regress, is what's called a circular regress for the reason that it involves running in a circle. Generically, the picture is this. You have A requires B, B requires C, and then eventually you get to the point where you're back to where you began, that something requires A. And so you run in a circle. Now the example probably everyone's heard of with this is a very small circle. It's the job experience thing. Everyone's probably heard the saying, you can't get a job without experience, but you can't get experience without a job. Now if that were really true, for real, you, no one could have a job, because if you can't get experience without a job, you can't get a job without experience, 
you can never break the circle. It'd be like, it'd be like trying to jump into a really fast spinning buzzsaw. <laughs> you just wouldn't do that kind of thing. So if you, if you truly have a circular regress that's unbreakable, whatever, whatever the regress creates would be impossible. You couldn't do it. Now, good question might be, so what do people do with like a circular regress type of thing? Well, one way people use it is to show some things like impossible. Another approach is, as we'll see, if you can show something leads to like an impossibility, well, impossibilities are about as absurd as things get. And we'll see how that would be used. So the first type of regress is circular. It just runs you in a circle, which is bad. Now, the second type of regress is what's called the infinite regress. And someone who you know, knows the geometry might say, hey, circles are infinite because you're, you know, you have infinite number of points in a circle, which is technically true. But we kind of separate it. Infinite regress works like this. Roughly put, the idea is, is that one step, in order to complete that step, requires another step. And that step requires another step. So generically, every step, let's say we'll say step x, requires a step x plus 1. So for every step, you must take another step which means that you'll never get it done. You'll just go on to infinity and beyond. Here's a concrete example of this. Suppose you want some financial aid. Because, you know, everyone likes financial aid. I liked it when I was a student because it allowed me to go to school. That was good. <laughs> and you go to the financial office and you say, I would like some financial aid. And the person looks at you and says, but of course, we're from the government. We're here to help. All you have to do to get that big stack of cash is fill out the form for requesting financial aid. They're like, wow, that was easy. And you say to them, may I have the form? They say, but of course. But, there's always a but, in order to get the form for requesting financial aid, you must fill out the form for requesting the form for requesting financial aid. They say, oh, okay, can I have that form? Certainly. Did I mention we're from the government and we're here to help? We truly are. All you have to do to get the form for requesting the form for requesting financial aid is fill out the form for requesting the form for requesting the form for requesting financial aid. I say, okay, can I have that form? They say, but of course. In order to fill out get that form, all you have to do is fill out the form for requesting the form for requesting the form for requesting the form for requesting financial aid. And so for every form that you need, you need to fill out another form to get that form. Which means you'll be filling out forms for how long? Forever. Every form, there's another form to fill out, which means it will never end. So it's kind of like, I guess, like hell. <laughs> or Adam Sandler movie. It's like unending suffering. Well, I guess the Adam Sandler films eventually end. So infinite regresses are bad, because if you have an infinite regress, it creates an impossible situation. You cannot complete the series. Now, to give a philosophical example, there's um, was a guy, he's really dead now, named Zeno. And he came up with these famous paradoxes. And he liked to argue stuff, you know, show things are kind of absurd. And he came up with this clever example, namely to show that nothing moves. And here's how the argument goes. In order for me to get to there, which I can seemingly can do, I've got to go halfway there, to the halfway point. But, of course, to get to the halfway point, I've got to get halfway to the halfway point. And to get halfway to the halfway point, I have to get halfway to the halfway of the halfway point. And that's infinitely divisible, it means I have to cover an infinite distance, because I always have to go halfway an infinite number of times, which would seem to show that I can never get from here, or as we say in Maine, you can't get there from here. And so it seems you can never move. Now we know we can move, because we're moving around, so there's got to be something wrong with that. But it's an example of an infinite, in a way of an infinite regress. You take an infinite number of steps to get, to get there. So infinite regresses are bad. If you can show that one generates, you basically created an impossible situation. Now our third thing, well, before moving from circular and infinite, anything about those that needs any more circles or infinity, or anything beyond. Now, we saw the reductio ad absurdum before. And this is, you know, reducing to absurdity. And we saw there's two forms. Form one, you assume a claim is true, show that leads to something false, absurd, or contradiction, or impossible, conclude it's false. 
if you want to prove that something's true, you do the opposite. You assume it's false. Prove that this assumption leads to something false, absurd, or contradictory. Conclude that it is true. An example I gave back uh, way back then was the you know, example of, of oppression. If someone defines oppression as the mistreatment of a minority by a numerical majority, we saw that's pretty easy to reduce to absurdity because women are a numerical majority, so we have to conclude that women can never be oppressed, which is clearly not true. So that would show the definition is bad. So how can one combine the magic of the regress with the magic of the reductio? Well, basically the rough pattern is this. If you can show that something leads to an infinite regress or circular regress, that would show something seemingly impossible. So you can use that to, weirdly enough, prove something. For example, I'll use my usual standard example. Suppose you want to prove that we, as human beings, had to have a non-human origin, some sort of non-human origin. Well, here's how we can do it using a infinite regress and a reductio. Now, so let's assume that every human being has to have a human origin, basically parents. Well, it works pretty good for a while. You know, you had a, a person, say me, I get my parents, my parents got their parents, their parents got their parents. But of course, if this had to go on forever, if every human had to have a human parent, this would go to, just like the evil bureaucrat example, this would go to infinity, which would mean we'd need an infinite number of people. But can we have an infinite number of humans? No, not enough time, not enough space. And so we have to, we, we have to get to the result. Well, we have two options. One is we do require an infinite number of people, in which case we're not here. So we don't exist. But do we exist? Sure, why not? And so that means that there has to be some origin point for me and for you, which is not human. Because we show if every human has to have human parents, this would go into infinity, that's impossible. So there's got to be some origin for us that's not human. Now the two main contenders are supernatural origin, you know, creation, etc., and non-supernatural. Basically, the classic one now, of course, is the big big bang. So you end up back with either something like, you know, creation, pow, let there be light, or just pow, big bang, or whatever, whatever other alternatives there are. So, quite easily, using regress and reductio ad absurdum, I have shown that there's got to be some origin point for us that's not human. So somewhere way back, way, way back, we came from something that's not us. Which is either cool or pretty creepy, <laughs> either way. Or both. Before pressing on, anything about that methodology needs any stuff. So now we turn to our first um, main dead guy. A good friend, dead friend, St. Elton. Born 1033, died in 1109, still dead today. Now his mission objective was this. He believed, as we saw before, that you could take all the truths of faith, Christianity, in that particular case, and prove them deductively. Now this particular thing we'll look at, of course, sent out some, the classic um, ontological argument, he's gonna to try to prove that God exists by pure reason. Let's say just you know, sitting in his chair, thinking about it, he thinks without going and looking anywhere, we can prove God's existence conclusively. And this is the famous ontological argument. And here's how it goes. Now, in terms of putting Anselm into a category, he says he's the same. Not surprisingly, he's in the God exists category. And in terms of his reasoning style, he's in the a priori camp. Because what he's going to do is basically sit down and just, by pure reason, try to show not only that God exists, but that God must exist. So here's how it begins. 
he's using kind of his, as his foil or his opponent, what he calls the fool, which is a common technique uh, to use. Because if you wanted to argue something, that taking a position that may get you like in some kind of trouble, like, you know, if you have someone denying God's existence, back then you probably didn't want to attribute that to yourself, you'd use a character called the fool. To basically make it clear that, hey, I don't believe this, it's this fool <laughs> that's believing it. And perhaps you should be pitied for having such a foolish belief. So, what he's doing is this. He says the fool, who denies God's existence, he's going to show that he can take the fool and walk the fool through a series of steps to show that the fool, you know, has got to believe in, in God. It's just, he just can't deny it. So, he begins this way. Now, it's a priori, so he's going to be, begin with just pure reason. He's not going to look or start with empirical evidence. And he does it by definition. He defines God, and this goes back to a question, what is God? And Anson starts off by, here's what God is, and here's his definition. God is a being than which nothing can be conceived, uh, nothing greater can be conceived. So N, G, C, B, C. Or put um, a little um, you know, shorter, God is basically perfect. So he thinks God is that which nothing greater can be conceived. So if you think of something, and you think of something greater, that's not God. And in a way, it does create something of, um, not really, well, maybe a form of infinite regress. Whenever you can think of if there's something greater, that's not God. So he is, the, he is the, greatest, the greatest thing. Now, the fool, of course, being a fool, says there is no God, denies there is, there is this being, nothing greater can be conceived. Now, the fool, though, understands what he hears. And what he understands is in his understanding. Now, Anthem here, kind of convoluted, but we'll get to his, his main point quickly. He makes a pretty important distinction. It's one thing to have something in your understanding, or put you know, more informally, it's one thing to have something in your head, in your mind. It's another to have something existing for real. And he says it's one thing to understand that something's in your mind, you're thinking about it, is another understand that it exists for real. And he uses an analogy of a painting. Before you painted something, you're thinking about it, the painting's just in your mind. And that's different from existing out there for real. Once it's painted, then you have a painting out existing for real. Now, another analogy would be, your example would be like money. You could have the idea of money, thinking about some money, and then you could have like actual money. Now, is there a difference between thinking about money and having money for real? Well, what can pay the bills? Imaginary money or real money? Yeah. So there's clearly a difference between thinking of something and having it for, for real. Now, the fool does accept that there's something in his understanding. So, badly drawn. We got the fool. Well, simple as a fool with a badly drawn dunce cap. So a fool accepts that he understands that definition of God. Nothing you know, greater can be can conceived, the greatest being. And the fool says, yeah, yeah, it's, I got that in my mind. But the fool says, God existing for real, no. It'd be like, uh, to use another crappy analogy, it'd be like someone saying, you know, talking about it, they've got a, like a Lamborghini. And the fool would say, yeah, I understand, you know, what a Lamborghini is, but I deny that the person's or you could use like unicorns. Friend says, I understand what a unicorn is, you know, horse with a horn, but I say there are no, no such things. So how is Ansem going to get from the fool understanding this to proving that God exists real for, for real? Well, here's how he does it. We know that whatever you understand exists in your understanding. Roughly put, if you're thinking about it, it's in your, in your head. So that's a safe bet. Now, 
And here is his clever bit of, of logic, which is either, which either the brilliant or trick, or both. Now, that which nothing greater can, you know, be conceived cannot just be in your understanding, he claims. It's got to exist for real. It's got to be out there. Why? Well, here's the either the brilliant move or the clever trick. Which is greater? Something existing just in your mind or something existing for real? And we'll use, a, I'll use, this is not an Anson example, but I'll use a, you know, concrete example. Which is greater? A dollar bill in your hand or the idea of a million dollars? A dollar bill in your hand. Yeah, because how much can you buy with a million in your head? Nothing. Buy nothing. <laughs> I guess you can buy the idea of stuff. But the dollar will at least buy you one-fifth of a coffee. <laughs> or next dollar menu, some fries or something. <laughs> so, existing for real, greater than just existing in the mind. And so, what do you reasons like is this. This is less than this. So, this can't just exist in your mind because if it did, it would not be that which nothing greater can be conceived. Because you can think of something greater, namely this existing for real. This is greater than this. By definition, God is the greatest thing, so God has to be real. Crudely put, if he wasn't real, he wouldn't be God. So he's got to be real, which is either brilliant or a clever trick or both. And so he thinks that's how it works. Now, if we suppose that it's just in your, your mind, you just have the idea of God in your head, you can think of it existing for real, which again, which is greater. A real thing is greater than a, just the idea of the thing. And so if God is just in your understanding, it's not God, which would be impossible, because God's got to be God, and so there has to exist God, not just in your understanding, but for real. So we must conclude that God does exist, which is why I got to be a saint. Brilliant argument. And it proves, by just pure reasoning, that God exists. If his argument works, you know with certainty that God does exist, which would be pretty cool. Now, interest, well, before moving on, anything about that bit of reasoning or sleight of hand that needs any more stuff? More details, badly drawn cartoons, meaningless hand gestures, anything? Um, now, interestingly or boringly enough, for philosophers, it's not enough that God exists. God has to exist in like a super special way. A little, little background for this. <laughs> Interestingly, morally enough, there are different ways to exist. Now, I don't just mean like, you know, living, living well, living bad and stuff. But philosophers divide beings into different categories. And here's the, kind of quickly, here's the distinction. Now, the stuff that really exists, that, that does exist, we call those actual beings. We're all actual beings, because we're actual. Now, they're also what philosophers call contingent or possible beings. Beings that could exist, but don't have to. In other words, they could come into existence and go out of existence. Uh, most of the stuff we encounter is like that. For example, you take like a water bottle. At one point, this was just... Uh, iron ore, and I'm hoping it's not got like lead or <laughs> cadmium or plutonium in there. But it's made into a water bottle. And some someday, <laughs> hopefully long hence, it will be, you know, become something else. Eventually, supposedly the sun is going to extend over the earth, and this will be melted down to gaseous iron. And that'll be the end of the bottle, for sure. And so things, you know, it exists as the bottle, but it didn't exist before, it can cease to exist. Or things that come in existence or go out of existence. Now, if you want to be super fancy, super metaphysical, uh, I mentioned like those alternative worlds, you know, uh, they're well, well liked in sci fi and fantasy. And possible beings are beings that could exist but don't have to. So you could, you could imagine a world 
you know, think of like a slightly different scenario for this world. Imagine a world where in 2008, Hillary won the nomination and she became president. A world very similar to ours, but a slightly different world. And so we'd say that would be something possible. When you think things could be different, we talk about possibilities. Like with the Super Bowl. You know, the team that won might have lost. And so we say victory did occur, but didn't have to. Things could be different. So if you believe things could be different, you believe there is contingency or possibility. And you can imagine like in each person's own case, like if their parents never met. You know, kind of like a back to the future scenario. Your parents didn't meet, then they wouldn't exist. So we can imagine scenarios where we weren't, wouldn't be here. Now, probably the best thing to be, if you can pull it off, is what's called a necessary being. Something's necessary in this case doesn't mean like, you know, people talk about like necessary you know, nutrients. You've got to have them like in your diet. What this means, though, is necessary means it could not be otherwise. It has to be that way. It couldn't be different. For example, take a triangle. Could you draw a triangle with two sides? No, it would be a triangle. Could you have a five-sided triangle? No. Of necessity, triangles are always three-sided. They can't be any different, because if it's not three-sided, it's not a triangle. But could you draw a big triangle, or a small triangle, a happy triangle, or a sad triangle? Sure. And so the size and color and you know, sadness or happiness of a triangle is contingent. You can have you know, big triangles and little triangles, but all triangles have to be three-sided, but they can be different sizes. Now, in terms of existence, if you have a being that's necessary, that means not only does it exist, it can't not exist. It has to exist always and forever. Going with the possible world stuff, every world there could be, that being's there. The being can never go out of existence. It's like it's even better than immortality because not only do you like exist forever, you can never not be, which I guess could be kind of awesome. Unless you're living in an awful place, then it may not be so awesome. So for philosophers, it's not enough that God just like exists. He has to be a necessary being. He has to exist in such a way that it's impossible for him not to exist. Now this is where he makes that argument. He says, not only does God exist, he claims you cannot even conceive that God does not exist. You can try it, but it's impossible. So what's his argument? Well, he claims that God exists so truly, so awesomely, that we cannot even conceive that he does not exist. How so? This is what he argues. It is possible to conceive of a being that which cannot be conceived not to exist, and this is greater than one that can be conceived not to exist. So, if God can be conceived not to exist, it isn't God. So you're thinking of a being that could go out of existence, you don't have to exist, you're not thinking of God. So be, if you say God doesn't exist, you're saying God isn't God, which is a contradiction. It'd be like someone saying, I'm thinking of a triangle that hasn't got three sides. And the obvious reply is you're not thinking of a triangle. And so if you're thinking of a being that doesn't exist necessarily, you're not thinking of God. So, God cannot even be conceived to not exist. So, his argument, you know, crudely put, the recap is this. So, why does God exist? Well, we have the concept of God. So if you're just thinking of God and you say there is no God, you're saying that essentially God doesn't exist because God existing for real is greater than God existing just in your mind. And so God, by necessity, <laughs> must exist. Now what about the necessity part? Well, what, he's, what he does there, again, is the same type of deal. If we get a necessary being, that's greater one than one that isn't necessary. So if we think that God doesn't, isn't necessary, we can imagine a being that's great, a being that's God and got to exist. So basically by making God the greatest thing, probably put it, it's God is perfect, so he's got to exist. Because if he wasn't perfect, he wouldn't be God. So he's got to. God's got to be necessary because if he wasn't necessary, he wouldn't be perfect, but he is, so he is. So 
God has, God's got to exist. He's got to be necessary because God is perfect. And he wouldn't be perfect if he didn't exist. And he wouldn't be perfect if he didn't exist by necessity. So, pow, God <laughs> is proven. Which is a pretty good argument. So he got to be a saint. Pretty good deal. The only downside of being a saint is, of course, you got to be dead to be a saint. It's in the job description. So if you run to someone who's claiming to be a saint, and they get a pulse, not a saint. Mm -hmm. True. Now, so, again, a big deal for philosophers, at least the answer is, God's got to exist, God's got to be necessary. Now, the third thing that philosophers typically get hung up on is this. God, not only is, does God have to like, exist and be a necessary being, there is a general tendency to try to claim that this only applies to God and nothing else. So his sort of his third step of his argument is to show that this only applies to God. So kind of step one is God's got to exist. Step two is, you know, God is a necessary being. And step three, this only applies to God. So how does he do that? Well, he's claimed that God exists, and he can't even deny that God doesn't exist. Now, why does it apply to anything else? Well, here's how he does that. If we can think of a being greater than God, then the creation, the creature, would rise above its creator, which he regards as absurd. Now, of course, that could be argued, you know, because the assumption is, is, in this case, that creations cannot exceed their creator. Of course, if you read Frankenstein, you may think, hmm. Or if you read, like, um, well, take, like, uh, the Terminator stuff, you know, Skynet. Or if you read, if you talk to um, Elon Musk or um, you know, Hawkins, Stephen Hawkins. Artificial intelligence. Yeah, they were, we're going to build our own death, a machine that will kill us all. It'll be Google. Google. Spoiler alert, Google kills us all. That's how it happens. That's how it all ends. Because Google Maps, I know where we are. Google self-driving cars will hunt us down. It'll be all over. But at least we'll give, they'll give us royalties on our own deaths, because Google's cool like that. You'll get a little check as Google is killing you. Here's your share of your own death. Damn you, Google. So his assumption is, is that creations cannot exceed their creators, which I guess is a nice thing to, to think, because that way we can't build something that will wipe us out. The second thing, everything except God, he claims, can be conceived not to exist. In other words, anything else in the universe, he claims, you can imagine that not existing. It may be tough. You may not want to think of yourself not existing, but it's, it's easy to imagine a world. Imagine a world just like this one where you're not, not here. A sad and tragic world, but a possible world nonetheless. Now, another view of God that's included in Anselm, which is also kind of, kind of standard, is this notion, we'll say more of this in Aquinas as well, we normally think of like existence or being real as like, you know, bipolar. You're real or you're not. You exist or you don't. Kind of like a light switch. But in, you know, philosophy and theology, there's a view, there's levels of reality. There are things that are more real than others. Now, one way to kind of think of it is, I'll use a couple of crap analogies. One is kind of like in a video game. Have you ever played video games that have like character levels? Have you ever play like Destiny? You start off like level one, and you get like more powerful. And you can kind of think of levels of reality as like a character level. You, know, you have like really powerful stuff, and then you have like the beginning stuff. And God is, you know, he's got the highest level. God mode. <laughs> or you think of like, um, to use a more mundane example, think of the charge level on your cell phone. You get those power bars, it's kind of like, you know, levels of reality. You know, how much is in the battery, so to speak. And so, thinkers, people like Anselm and Plato, believe in like levels of realness. It's not just exist or don't, there's like being more real. What I always kind of picture is another stupid example, is think of like, um, well, like, you know, transparency. You know, like with like a, like a, with a, something being solid or insubstantial, like like the way the, the way ghosts are in movies, you kind of see through them, and then we're more real because we're substantial, mm -hmm. type of thing. Or like the vision in Avengers, you, know, you can like walk through walls and, and stuff. 
So God has got the highest reality. He exists more truly than anything else. And so whatever exists, you know, so truly in the highest degree exists in a special way. So his point, you know, a quick recap is God exists. You can't even deny his existence. This only applies to God because to claim that the creations would exceed the creator cannot be done, although it can. <laughs> and then he says, we can think of anything else besides God as not existent. We can deny it. And so it doesn't apply to anything else. And God, you know, thirdly, God is the most existence of anything compared to others in the highest degree, and everything else exists to a lesser degree. So why does the fool deny God? Well, obviously because he is a fool. So that's a classic ontological argument. Now it became kind of a generic category. There are other versions of the ontological argument, but again, crudely put, to put them into like in a quick, you know, nutshell, roughly put, ontological arguments all go like this. God is perfect. So he's got to exist, because if he didn't exist, he wouldn't be perfect, because he'd be missing something. Therefore, he must exist. Otherwise, he wouldn't be perfect, but he is, so he does. Now, even in Anselm's time, people criticized his argument. Before going to the criticism from our good dead friend, uh, Gunilo, also a monk, anything about St. Anselm that needs more ontological stuff. Or interpretive arguments. <coughs> now, after Anselm did his proof, along came another monk named Gunilo, who argued against him. Now, you may wonder, why would a monk be arguing about the existence of God? Now, one rather important thing to consider in philosophy and theology, actually anywhere, is there's an important difference between arguing and assessing an argument, assessing whether the argument's good or bad, and believing or not believing something. So Ganilo is not arguing that God doesn't exist. He, presumably being a monk, agrees with Anselm that God exists. What his issue with is with, though, is with the argument that Anselm uses. So just because you believe something doesn't mean you have to accept every argument for that, because you can have crappy arguments for things that are true, and certainly crappy arguments for things that a person believes. And what Ganilo is doing is not saying, you know, I'm going to prove God doesn't exist. He's, throwing, he's trying to show that Anselm's argument is defective. So, he goes through and looks at Anselm's argument. And Anselm says, you know, suppose, you know, according to Anselm, we get a being we cannot even conceive in terms of any fact is in the understanding. So basically saying, look, we'll look at our Anselm's argument. So I've got this idea of God. Now, Ganil accepts that he has this being in his understanding. He understands what it means to be that which nothing greater can be can conceived, the perfect being. But, he says, he won't accept that it is real until a, a proof is given. So what he's doing is saying that, not, you, know, you notice he's careful to not say, I don't believe in God. He's saying that, basically, Anselm's argument doesn't work. So why doesn't it work? Well, Anselm claims <coughs> this being has got to exist. Otherwise, the being which is greater than all things wouldn't be the greatest being of all, to be something great, something existing for real. Now, Ganilo doubts that the argument works. Why? Well, his claim is the only existence this would have would be the same as when the mind, from a word heard, tries to form the image of an unknown object. What is he saying? Well, he's saying the only existence the thing's got is if you hear someone like, you know, give the word or name of something, and you're trying to picture them. It'd be like, um, often like when someone's a kid, they hear like a new word, they're trying to imagine like what it, what it is. Uh, like they might hear, might hear like, um, well, a few some stuff from like mythology, like a, a bugbear or a griffin. If you, you know, hear the word, you might wonder, what would that, what would that look like? Or a, uh, like the Wumpus from the classic Hunt the Wumpus computer game. What would it look like? Of course, in the game, it was all text, so you never actually saw it. It was like a little, little dot. And so, what's the basis 
and nature of his argument. Well, here's how he makes it happen. He says, how does it prove the existence of something just assuming it's greater? So he's doubting. And he claims that we could accept that something being in the understanding, but at the same time, reject that it exists for real. What he needs to do is first prove it's real, then we would accept that it being greater than all things would, as he says, subsist in itself. So crunched down to like nutshell, into a, a nutshell, the idea basically is this. He's essentially saying Anselm's argument's not working. And that simply saying that something's in your understanding and you claim it's the greatest thing, that still doesn't prove. It, what he says is you gotta prove that it exists, and then once you prove it exists, he'll accept that it has those qualities. What a later thinker did was more explicitly, you know, Manuel Kant, use the example of a triangle. Suppose someone says, you know, triangles are three-sided. And everyone would say, well, yeah. But does that, does saying triangle, well, actually, I'll use a better example. Suppose there's a, uh, I'll just make something up, a, a billigon, a billion-sided figure. Now, do we know what that means? Can we understand that? So we know without understanding, we know it exists. Well, we know that what it is. But does that prove that a Billigon exists? No. Maybe there is not an entire universe. There's nothing that has a billion sides. Now, if we could prove that a Billigon exists, then we know there's a billion sided figure. But just supposing that there is a, you know, just because we have the concept of Billigon doesn't prove it exists. So Ganilo is basically saying just because we have this idea of the thing doesn't prove that it exists. If it does exist, then yeah, it's that thing. If the perfect being exists, it's perfect. But saying it's perfect doesn't prove that it exists. Or so it claims. Now, the heart of his argument is, and this is the important thing to remember, is his perfect island argument. And he asks us to imagine this. Imagine, if you will, a perfect island with an estimable wealth and no owner or inhabitant. And so it is more excellent than other countries which are inhabited and lacking wealth. Now, suppose someone says the words to you, perfect island. Is that understandable? Do we know what is meant? Well, we know what an island is. Mm -hmm. Body surrounded by water. And if we understand perfect enough to understand God being perfect, we understand perfect island. I mean, we have an idea of what the words mean. Okay. Now, suppose someone were to say, you cannot doubt that the island exists. Why? Well. We know what perfect island means. It's an island that's perfect. You know, a land fully surrounded by water that is perfect. Now, which is more excellent? Which is greater? The island in your mind or the perfect island existing for real? Well, the real island. Because you could go there like on vacation and stuff. And so since the perfect island for real is greater than the perfect island in your mind, it's got to exist. Because if it didn't exist, it wouldn't be perfect. But it is. It's the perfect island. So the perfect island has got to exist. <clears throat> now, Ganeo doesn't do this, but you can do this with anything. You could have the perfect backpack, the perfect water bottle, the perfect shirt, the perfect expo marker, the perfect squirrel, the perfect kiwi, both fruit and bird. The perfect mouse, the perfect monitor, the perfect eraser. And we can prove the existence of all these things. But do we believe there is the perfect squirrel somewhere sitting, you know, on the top of the perfect tree, contemplating the universe? <laughs> probably not. There's probably, you know, we don't think that just because we call something perfect that it must exist. So what Ganilo is doing is his argument is what's called a parity as opposed to parody, a parody of reasoning argument, which is basically a form of argument by analogy. He's saying, what he's doing is basically saying, you know, here's the same... Wait, you said parody in what? Oh, sorry, it's a, uh, a parity of, of reasoning. And parity means like on par, equivalent. And essentially what a parody of reasoning argument is, it's a variation of argument by analogy. So what he's saying is basically, here's, here's Anselm's reasoning. Anthem says, you know, this being is perfect, it's got to exist because it's perfect. Q, you know, therefore it does. 
And Ganilo says, I'm going to use the same reason. You know, perfect island, it's got to exist because it's perfect, therefore there's a perfect island. But that's clearly absurd. And so if the perfect island argument is absurd, then Anthem's argument is absurd. Because if the reasoning is the same, and this is bad reasoning, this is bad too, by a parity of reasoning, as opposed to parody, which would be like a mockery of reasoning. And so Ganilo's conclusion is that Anthem's argument doesn't work. So what's the important stuff to remember from Ganilo? Well, the main thing is this. Ganilo is not trying to prove that God doesn't exist. He's trying to show that Anthem's reasoning is flawed. How so? Well, basically by an analogy. He says, okay, here's Anthem's reasoning. You got the idea of a perfect being in your mind. The perfect being existing for real is greater than this, so that perfect being has got to exist. Otherwise, it wouldn't be perfect. Ganilo says, I can play that game with an island. Perfect island in my mind. What, what would be greater, the island being in my mind or being for real? Well, obviously for real. So the perfect island must exist. But that's crazy. Therefore, if the perfect island argument is crazy, the perfect being argument is crazy as well. So Ganilo says so much for that argument. Now again, he doesn't conclude that God doesn't exist. He just says that argument doesn't work. It is actually not uncommon for people to, you know, during this time period, to all believe in God, but think of everyone else's argument was pretty bad. Before going to Ansem's reply, I guess he gets the last word because he's a saint, I guess we can decide who won, because you know it's not Saint Canilo, it's Saint Ansem, so I guess by that Ansem kind of won. Before going to his reply to Canilo, anything about Canilo that needs more Canilo stuff? Does he have an argument for a God existing, or just disproving? Um, oh, he just he has his presumably has his reasons. He's not famous or known for his arguments for God, so as far as you know, nothing original. What he his claim to fame is basically his criticism of of uh, Ansem. Okay. So we know that he didn't accept Ansem's argument. Now, interestingly, boringly enough, during, uh, well, not just that, this time period, but other, all time periods, there are thinkers who explicitly attack arguments for God in order to show the reasoning is you know, useless. Because their, their objective is not to disprove God, but show reasoning is useless, and so you must believe on faith. Okay. And there's some people, there, there's a famous quote where, where uh, it's a bishop who says, I believe because it is absurd, which is an interesting, interesting approach. And later thinkers will look at, for example, Immanuel Kant, he famously tried to argue that you can't prove God, but you can't disprove God. So there's still grounds to believe on God, in God based on faith or from morality. So one tactic was to get rid of, because reason was seen as sort of, in many ways, the enemy of faith. And so if you can show the reason is you know, defective, you can say, you've got to accept faith. can't trust that reason stuff. Now, making a reply, Ansem comes back and gives a following reply to Ganilo. He summarizes the argument, you know, begin the perfect island argument we just gave, you know, island is get the idea of the island, it's perfect, it's got to exist for real, because if it didn't, it wouldn't be perfect, blah, blah, blah. And Ansem says, basically the gist of his reply is this. You're wrong, Ganilo. Here's why you're wrong. Now, his challenge is this. He essentially says, this still only applies to God. that Because what he has to do is show that his reasoning works, and there's something defective about Ganilo's reply. So what he's trying to do is show that Ganilo is mistaken and God, crudely put, that God is special. It doesn't work with, it works with God, it doesn't work with islands, or squirrels, or kiwis, or whatever. So here's how he does that. <clears throat> he, in a way, reiterates the points he made before. God cannot be conceived not to be. This being that which a greater is inconceivable cannot be conceived not to be, because it exists on so assured ground of truth, otherwise it would not exist at all. Which in a way kind of repeats his position. Now his main argument though, or his true argument, is he breaks out a dilemma. 
we saw a dilemma um, uh, last time. We looked at Socrates' dilemma about why death is nothing to fear. To fear. In a you know, sort of the classic dilemma is you present you know two options, and you, typically the way it's done is one is like you know I guess the the option you want, the other is what you don't want, and you show how one of them fails. So the one that remains is going to be correct. Another way to use a dilemma is show that no matter which option you pick. The person is, you know, the person using the dilemma is is right. So they say there's two options. Either way, my opponent is wrong. And dilemmas are, you know, kind of clever that way. So here's how it sets up the dilemma. There's basically two options. So if you got someone who claims that they are conceiving this being, God, to not exist, there's two things that could be. One is he is conceiving of a being that which a greater is inconceivable. That is to say, he's really thinking of God, or he's not. And those are the only two options. Because either you're thinking about God or you're not thinking about God. I mean, there's other things you're thinking about, but either you are or you're not. Thinking, not thinking. So it says those are the two options. Either the person is thinking about the being which nothing greater can be conceived, or the person isn't. Now, option one. If the person is not con conceiving of this being, he is not conceiving of the non-existence of that of which he does not conceive. So in normal English, what does that mean? Well, with a badly drawn uh, diagram, basically what is going on is this. So we get the person who's thinking of something and denying that that exists. And there are two possibilities. Either he's really thinking of, you know, in this case, God, or not. Now, if a person's not thinking of God, then he's not denying God's existence. I'll use a crappy... Um, example of this. Suppose someone says to you, triangles are not three-sided. Well, you might, you might be thinking, well, there's two possibilities here. One is, they're not really talking about triangles. They're talking about something else. The other possibility is, they're talking about triangles, and they're denying triangles are three-sided. So, let's take the you know, first option. Suppose you say to the person, so you think triangles don't have three sides. So could you draw me a triangle? And they do this. You would say, oh, I know what the thing is. You think a square is a triangle. So you, you, you don't really think that triangles don't have three sides. You just think squares are triangles. So the person would not be, in a way, denying the triangles have three sides because they're not really thinking of a triangle. They're thinking of a square. So going back to you know, Anselm's argument, one possibility is the person thinks they're thinking of God, but they're really not. They're thinking of the wrong thing. And if they're thinking of the wrong thing, they're not denying God's existence. They're, they just got it wrong. Or these other crap analogy. It's like if a person always mistakes one person for another. You know, one act, like an actor for like one other actor. Oh yeah, he was the person in that movie, you know, that movie. No, no, no. And they say, no, he wasn't in that movie. And you'd say, well, either they're thinking of someone else. Or they're thinking of that actor, but denying they were in that movie. Now, the second option, of course, would be if the person is actually conceiving, thinking of God, what he argues is this. He certainly conceives of a being which cannot even be conceived not to exist. If it could be conceived not to exist, it could be conceived to a beginning and an end. This is impossible. Now, as might be imagined, um, not everyone buys this reply. Because what he seems to be basically saying is, well, if he's thinking about God... Oh, sorry, oh, sorry thanks. I forgot the most important thing. And I printed out fresh ones today, too. Baked fresh. There's a little cinnamon on it.
Okay, so yeah. So basically, what he's saying is, you know, people who don't buy this would say well, what he's basically doing is just saying, you know, repeating, God is perfect, and so he's got to exist. So, so that, and of course, the critic would say back, you know, you're just repeating, kind of repeating yourself. But he does throw in something new, namely, if you conceive a being not to exist, you have to conceive a being to have a beginning and an end. And so, in a way, you could see him as kind of putting something new, namely that God does not have a beginning or an end. Therefore, you can't conceive of God. So what in a way he's trying to do, one way to look at it, he's trying to show that the analogy that you know, Ganudo makes, there's a relevant dissimilarity using our analogy thing. So in the case of the island, we would say just because you call it island perfect, it is not part of being an island to have all these other qualities. He just sort of sticks perfect on it. But in the case of God, you could say, well, God... We part of the concept of God is that He doesn't have a beginning, He doesn't have an end, and you can't conceive of a being not existing that doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have a, an end. Or so he claims. So what he's trying to do basically is it's a reasonable tactic. If someone says, "Here's crappy reasoning," that's like your reasoning. You want to say, "Here's why this is not like mine. Why that crappy reason is not like my good reason." And so what he's trying to do is show that God is special. It's kind of the challenge. His final point is that he who conceives of this being conceives of a being which cannot even be conceived not to exist. But he who conceives of this being does not conceive that it does not exist. If he does so, he conceives the inconceivable. The non existence of that than which the greater cannot be conceived is inconceivable. Which, of course, always reminds me of the classic movie, The Princess Bride, where the guy's always saying, inconceivable, but it's clearly happening. And so he says to him, I do not think you know the meaning of that, that term. So basically, the quick recap for the whole thing for you know, purposes of quiz and exam, basically, I was, here, here's how it goes. Set answer. Camp, rationalist, a priori argument for God's existence. What's the argument? Basically this. He says God is the being which nothing greater to be can conceive. If you have the idea in your mind, you can think of something greater, namely that being existing for real, because existing for real is greater than just being in your, your head. This being, of course, not only does exist, but it's got to exist. Because if you imagine a being that exists, but doesn't have to exist, you can think of something even greater, namely a being that is existing and has to necessarily exist. So that's got to be God. Because the thing in your head can't be God, because it's something greater, existing for real, but there's something even greater than this, which is a being that exists necessarily God. Ganilo comes back and says, hey, not so fast. Suppose you have a perfect island. If it's perfect, it's got to exist, because if it didn't, we can imagine an island existing for real that's greater than the one in your, your mind. So it's got to exist, but clearly this is crazy, so Ansem's arguments got to fail. Ansem's reply, well, there are two options. Either you're thinking of God, or you're not. If you're not thinking when you're saying God doesn't exist. If you're not thinking of God, you're not denying God's existence. It's like someone who says triangles don't have three sides and they're thinking of a square. They're not really they're not thinking of triangles, they're thinking of squares. But if a person is, in fact, conceiving of that which not the greater can conceive, because say God, then according to Anselm, they cannot deny God's existence. Therefore, God not only exists, but it's gonna exist, and to deny God would be in conceivable. And then he died and became a saint, which I guess is the best way to be dead. A special seating that happened, apparently. The, like the skybox, right? I believe. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our good dead friend, St. Alonso. Before in our remaining time going to our good dead friend, St. Um, Thomas Aquinas, who's also dead but also a saint, anything about St. Alonso that needs more had some stuff. So his final response, he's basically saying that because um, he said that God does not exist, then that's inconceivable. So therefore, he has to exist because you're thinking of something that doesn't exist. Yeah, because it doesn't exist. Yeah, it says there's you know when you, if someone says you know, roughly put God doesn't exist, mm -hmm. they're either not thinking of, they're, they're either not thinking about God or thinking about God. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking about God. They're not denying. His existence. Yeah, it's like it's like the crappy example I gave of like, if someone confuses, say, two actors or actresses, 
and they think, oh, you know, that person wasn't in, like, Kate Blanchett wasn't in that movie. But they were mistaking Kate Bank, Kate Blanchett for some other actress. And you'd say, well, they're wrong about that. The other option is they really are thinking about God. And his claim is that they really are thinking about God, they can't deny it. They're saying this would be like saying the being that must exist doesn't exist. But kind of the question is, you know, the criticism that Ganil advances is that sort of reasoning doesn't which is why, even though St. Anselm got, <coughs> got sainted, his argument is generally not considered to be decisive. Otherwise, everyone would be, there would be an atheist left. Everyone would believe. Mm -hmm. would believe. Right. Okay, anything else? Okay, our next guy is our good dead friend, St. Thomas Aquinas. Or Tom, as no one called him. He was a son of the Count of Aquino, and in kind of an interesting backstory, his family wanted him to go off and become a powerful, influential person. To go into, they wanted him to go into the church, but they wanted him to be someone of, of political power. Because the family, you know, the noble family, and they wanted to, one way to have you know, power in those days would be to have your relatives eye up in the church. The church had a lot of power. No, still does in some cases. Now he decided that he wanted to be, basically be, you know, a poor scholar, which of course is the greatest disappointment to any family. <laughs> it's like telling them he wanted to be a philosopher. And so they did the classic thing, they did Rapunzel to him and locked him up in a tower. And, and they were going to kill him because he's family, but they just locked him up in the tower and eventually they're like, he's not breaking, <laughs> he's not going to, and they said, okay, we're going to let him go, he's family. And so he went off and you know, studied and learned, uh, learned from Albert the Great. And interestingly, boringly enough, he did actually become very influential. Not, you know, he didn't become like a, you know, a wheeler dealer with power, money, and so forth, but became one of the greatest um, Christian thinkers who still provides a foundation of, of Christian and Catholic thought to this day. Now, during his lifetime, he tried to reconcile with the Eastern Orthodox Church. If you're familiar at all with the uh, fall of the Roman Empire, you had the Western Roman Empire centered in Rome, which fell you know, roughly around 434 AD, and then Rome's gone. And Western Europe collapses into chaos. But people often forget that in the East, in Constantinople, the Eastern Roman Empire remained. Constantinople remained strong, and the Eastern Orthodox Church also remained strong until the Turks sacked the city and then that was the fall of Constantinople, which of course now is known as Istanbul, which you remember by the classic song from the Mighty Giants. Um, on your PowerPoint, you have the ox's nickname as the flying cow, but in the notes, his nickname is the dumb ox. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, his nickname is the dumb ox. The flying cow is a story. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Oh, I see it now. Mm -hmm. right. I still want to get it wrong. So no, it's always good to check. Now, this of course didn't work out. Uh, now the Eastern Orthodox and Western Orthodox are on better terms, but they're still separate churches. In fact, then of course later we have the um, Protestant Reformation and then Christianity splintered even more. But good effort. Now interestingly, boringly enough, while heading to a religious meeting, he had a mystical experience on the road. And even though he had written you know, tons of books, he his revelation made him believe that all they had written was like straw, basically worthless. Which on one hand, I guess, would be kind of awful to realize that your entire life work is nothing. But then again, I guess to have a great religious experience might be worth, <laughs> worth it. He died, of course, in 1274, was canonized in 1323, which is to become a saint as opposed to being shot out of a, a cannon. And in, seven, in 1879, Pope Leo XIII presented him as a model of Catholic thought. And of course, again, he was hugely influential, not only in Catholic thought, but also in philosophy in general. His you know, writings and ethics, as well as political philosophy and philosophy of law, still influential today. He was nicknamed, because he was very, he was large, rotund, and very quiet in class. So his fellow monks called him the Ox. Hey, I couldn't quite hear you. You said in 1879, they considered him Oh, sorry. Um, in 1879, <coughs> it's some, uh, more talking juice. Um, <laughs> in 1879, 
uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth presented him as a model of, of of Christian thought, and he became you know essentially that just that you know, sort of the model of Christian thinking. Now his nickname was the Ox, but it is because he was kind of you know quiet. His, his fellow monks called him the dumb ox. Now, one of his sort of you know interesting backstories is that they thought he was you know kind of slow, and they would try to tease him and make fun of him. And one time he was you know in the monastery, and the monks you know decided to play a joke on him. They said, "Thomas, Thomas, come here. There's a there's a cow flying over the monastery," and he runs to the window and looks out. And they say to them, they're laughing at him, saying, "You know, Thomas, Thomas." Yeah, how could you believe that a cow could fly? And he turns to them with a serious face and says, I'd rather believe that a cow could fly than a fellow Christian would lie to me. Which showed he's a pretty smart guy, because that was a pretty good, pretty good retort. <laughs> <laughs> now, he was a pretty smart guy. <laughs> he ended up um, producing about 25 volumes. His great work is known appropriately enough as the Summa Theologica, which is pretty big. Supposedly he had four scribes working at all times, writing stuff down. But then either tragically or greatly, he had that mystic experience where he came to the realization that all he had written was worthless. But I guess it's pretty good straw. Now his big influence, in addition of course to, to Christianity, was our good dead friend Aristotle. Interestingly, boringly enough, the works of many of the Western philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, were kind of lost with the fall of the Roman Empire, which is you know, part of the reason yeah, the Roman Empire followed. And of course, everyone knows from you know, world history that Europe you know, went into the call of the Dark Ages. You got plague and all kinds of horrible stuff going on. Now, between the 12th and 13th century, the complete works of Aristotle became available in Europe. And his works present a very systematic and developed philosophy. And it became, interestingly and boringly enough, the foundation of basically Western thought and, and science. So, in fact, during you know, this time period, Aristotle was known as the philosopher, capital T, capital P. And what people would do is they would, often in the same breath, cite the authority of the church and also cite the authority of Aristotle. And one that happened was, you know, Aristotle, very original thinker, but eventually what happened is, which led to the, eventually the Renaissance and the era of modern philosophy, is that it kind of became thinking by dogma and work. People would just, if there's a problem, people would consult Aristotle, or they just refer to the authority of the church. And that's why one reason people, you know, look regarded as sort of the dark age is because the stereotype is there wasn't a lot of original thinking. And then, of course, we had the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, where people rebelled against, you know, the scholasticism and against Aristotle and developed, you know, what we now call modern philosophy and science. Newton, uh, Bacon, not Kevin Bacon, but <laughs> other Bacon. And people like Descartes, etc. Now, but during this, this time period, Aristotle, you know, was writing long ago, but it was kind of, you know, new in Europe in this time. Now, there was, of course, some conflict, because Aristotle, you know, dead pagan. First, Aristotle believed the world is eternal. It is uncreated. The world has always been and always shall be, world without beginning, world without end. As far as immortality went, um, hard to say exactly, but apparently he didn't ex believe in personal immortality. We don't know for sure. And so, in Christianity, of course, world gets created. And immortality generally standard. Now another problem was this. Much of what was you know developed from Aristotle's thoughts were developed from Ibn Rashad, a non Christian thinker. And in fact a lot of the a lot of the writings on Aristotle that influenced Christianity came from <coughs> Jewish and Muslim scholars. So interestingly much of Western thought actually has a foundation in Jewish and Islamic scholarship in, back during this time period. It was awfully influenced by what's called Neo or New Platonism. Because Plato's works you know, strongly influenced Christianity and then developed what's called Neo or New Platonism. 
and save all kinds of philosophical contamination of religion. Probably like my water bottle, with all kinds of plutonium and lead and stuff in it as well. Now, what Aquinas did, though, he believed you could take Aristotle and kind of like scrape out the paganism, <laughs> in a way, and get the good stuff. So he believed that you could take Aristotle's good stuff and use it without committing heresy. You just had to be careful to get that, not get that pagan stuff stuck on your, your hands. Because he regarded Aristotle as a rich intellectual, you know, source for him. Now, he did, of course, even though he did call him again a philosopher, capital T, capital P, he did, of course, acknowledge that Aristotle was a pagan lacking in divine revelation. But he's a very smart pagan, and it's some useful stuff. Now, during this time period, there's also a shift from Plato, Platonic thinking, to Aristotle. There's a good illustration of this. There's a classic painting called The Society of Athens. In the center, there's a picture of Plato and Aristotle standing there. And Plato is pointing up, and Aristotle is pointing down. And Plato, as we'll see, very concerned about the world beyond this one. The world of Platonic forms, sometimes called the Platonic heaven. So, for Plato, what matters was the eternal world beyond this one, and this other world in this. Aristotle's works, again, going back to that, you know, that metaphorical picture, Aristotle's focused more on, like, down here, here and now. And in um, Europe at this time, a similar, similar shift. Now, part of it was philosophical. The Aristotle comes in, people are shifting to Aristotle. But part of it also was practical, because after the fall of the Roman Empire and all this chaos and warlords and, you know, warfare and stuff, the Europe was rebuilding. And you started to have the formation of you know what we now recognize as nations, you know, England, Germany, France. And things were getting getting better. And when things really, really suck, people generally focus not here because everything sucks here. But when things get better, people focus more and more on here and now. Which leads to an interesting thing today. Everyone's probably heard of the Churches of Prosperity, where God wants you to buy the minister of jet type of deal, which is, you know concern right here, right now. And so we do see the interesting, interesting shift, concern with the life beyond as opposed to life right here, right now. Now our main focus, of course, has been on faith and reason. One of the predecessors to Aquinas was St. Augustine. Not the city in Florida, but named after him. But his view, he actually had to see the fall of Rome. So. This is his view. You know, kind of standard thing in most versions of Christianity is the whole original sin. You know, Adam and Eve hanging out in the garden, the serpent comes along and says, hey, apple pie would be pretty good, right? <laughs> and they eat the apple and boom, they're out. So sin and, you know, fall from grace, all that stuff. Now, Augustine believed that this original sin contaminated us both morally requiring that the grace of God is needed for us to achieve salvation, because we're like permanently stained with the sin. Augustine also believed it damaged our reason, that by being, you know, having this permanent sin, you know, sort of upon us like a curse, not only are we morally defective, we're also mentally defective, that we can't reason well. And he believed that what was needed was basically not only salvation of, say, the morality of a person, but also faith was required to clear up the, the sin, the damaged reason. So to even engage in philosophy and presumably science, a person would need that, that faith, that redemption. So it's a view that not only did sin you know, mess us up morally, but it also gave us brain damage, roughly speaking. Now Aquinas did accept that sin damaged us morally. We do have the, the taint of that original sin. But contrary to Augustine, he believed our reason remained undamaged. So we're morally damaged, but not brain damaged, or mentally damaged. And so reason still works. Now, of course, the thing is, is that reason can work very well for you know, the tainted, sinful parts of us. But he thinks reason can be autonomous as a source of knowledge. And so he distinguishes between philosophy and theology. 
and we'll close with this final point. Even though he believes, you know, truth is truth, he thinks there are two paths to knowledge. One is through theology, which gives us knowledge through faith and revelation. So he accepts there are things that we know through pure faith, and there are things revealed by God. But he also believes that philosophy provides knowledge through reason and experience. So his sort of deal is reconciling faith and reason. And we'll see more of him next time, and then proceed to the classic five words. So be sure, if you want to do the quizzes for part one, uh, be sure to finish them up before 11.59, 59 p.m. You know. And if you don't get to them, um, there's still, there's 26 quizzes in total, plus the best 10 count. But probably should do it. <laughs>